So, in this video, we're going to touch on an aspect of shamanism. Real shamanism, not the modern bullshit. And if you're the least bit familiar with this channel, I think you know how I feel about that topic. But if you're new, check out my video, Seven Signs to Know You're Not a Shaman. That should give you a clue. Now, I'm fully aware that shamanism, the word shamanism or shaman is a relatively modern term, but it represents something very ancient. Something with a raw intensity that the hucksters have no knowledge of or willfully ignore. And the ubiquity of this practice we know as shamanism can still be found among the world's elder cultures, those who have retained that ancient, hallowed purity going back to the very foundations of human consciousness. Purity is in the primal, as I like to say, the primal in history and the primal in the psyche. For we all, if we go back far enough, have shamanic animistic roots. But in first world Western cultures, that link to the animistic past has long been broken. As stated though, there are still many unbroken chains to this past though. One of them being Tengrinism, an ancient religion still practiced in Central Asia. It is considered to be one of the oldest religions with both polytheistic and monotheistic aspects that incorporate totemism, ancestor worship, animism, and thus shamanism. To begin with, the words Tengri and Sky were synonymous with the, within the lexicon of the ancient Mongol and Turkic peoples. And the chief deity of their pantheon is called Tengri, a sky father who created the universe. <clears throat> the physical appearance of Tengri is unknowable for he is the timeless, infinite blue sky. Now, there's also a god called Ungan, if I'm pronouncing that correctly said to be the creator god who is sometimes believed to be separate from the sky father while some believe he's an avatar of tangri anyway ancient turkic and mongol people believed that tangri governed all of existence believing their personal and governmental powers were mandated by him followers of tangriism who lean toward the polytheistic, reg recognize other gods and goddesses. And one of them is Erlik Khan, the god of the underworld, nature spirits, and death. Erlik Khan is a Satan-like figure that lives underground, illuminating his hellish realm with a dark light that shines upon the enslaved souls that fail to perform ritualistic sacrifices to him. Even though he was the creation and former protege of the creator god Tengri, or Ungan, take your pick, he was cast out of the mortal realm after he betrayed the creator. Originally, he had helped Ongen in the creation of the world, but it was said Ehrlich envied Ongen and planned to make his own world. And he tried seducing those early human beings into taking the forbidden fruit from the first tree. Sounds familiar. As a result, he was banned from the celestial realms and into the hell-like depths called Tamog, that which is opposed to the upper world of light. And it is from Tamog that Ehrlich and a host of demons, or spirits, cause misfortune, sickness, and death. Now, to counter these evil forces, it is said that one can perform sacrificial rites to pacify Ehrlich's evil spirits. But often, shamans are needed to risk the dangerous descent into the horrifying realm where they seek to retrieve the souls of the inflicted. 
I wonder if Debbie, the wannabe shaman from Des Moines, would be up to that task. I seriously fucking doubt it. Now, there is an interesting twist to the Ehrlich story. This is because his role is not always seen as completely negative, for he has a special relationship with the souls of human beings. For in traditions, it's said that Ongen made bodies from the soil and Ehrlich breathed their, their souls into them. And when Ehrlich had completed the work of giving souls to humans, Ungen considered destroying them, thinking that people were contaminated. But Ehrlich didn't believe this. Now, it's said that he created evil spirits to teach humans to sin, which would allow him to claim their souls. Is it possible that he did this to save humans from being destroyed by Ongen? If so, then who's really the bad guy here? In almost all cases, though, Ehrlich is seen as the devil-like figure who in some ways remains a servant to Ongen, not unlike the relationship between Yahweh and Satan in the Old Testament. In this interpretation, he is an administrator of divine justice by order of Ungen, where he judges the dead by adding up white and black pebbles representing good and evil deeds. And if they are more black than white, they are condemned to hellish punishment and torture by Ehrlich's executioners. Or are they? As I've stated, Ungen wanted to eliminate humankind because they were contaminated with souls. So why would Ehrlich want to harm those that he breathed that very soul into? Souls as in consciousness, intellect. This is a fascinating notion, for I see Ehrlich Khan as another archetypal manifestation of the Prince of Darkness, he who has aided humanity by giving us a questioning intellect, or the Black Flame. Ungen wanted or wants mindless automatons, easy to control, those blessed in their ignorance. Ehrlich, on the other hand, wants us to think for ourselves. Thus, another example of a myth encapsulating the struggle between the two paths, the right and the left. There is truth, though, in the fact that those who dare to question the authority of the divine Sky Father or God will suffer the consequences. Those consequences being the threat of nihilism, which sends many people to hell, but those who walk the left-hand path are able to find meaning in that hell. So, in conclusion, my friends, I hope you found that myth of Ehrlich Khan, as fascinating as I did, I, I love discovering new connections to the path. But while we on the left hand path might find Ehrlich Khan's tale to be empowering, the common interpretation or established moral at its core is those who mindlessly follow are good and those who question and doubt are evil just like so many other religions, huh? Until next time.